One of the things that differentiates science from everyday rational behavior is that to do science and engineering, you need special tools because our senses are limited. I mean, the senses even can't really be trusted 100% of the time. I mean, we only have three color receptors in our eyes, and then the rest is all interpolated and, 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 uh, and, and integrated in our brains to come up with, you know, other colors and so forth. Also, we put our fingers down on something and we know that the object is mostly empty space because of the Rutherford gold foil experiments, because the electrons are so far away from the nuclei that most of it's empty space. Yet when we touch an object, we feel that it is uh, that it is solid, right? So our senses, you know, we can know these things, but we, uh, we need help, right? Our senses need help. And in order to help us, we need to exploit certain physical principles in order to obtain more information about objects. And those are called uh, characterization tools. And characterization tools that we are discussing in this chapter include uh, spec spectroscopy and imaging. And they are they can be related, um, and in many modalities they are related. But in general, spectroscopy is learning something about the structure of matter by shining one type of particle in and getting some other kind of particle out uh, the other the other side. And that's what uh, that's what spectroscopy uh, spectroscopy is. So if you think about uh, how we know the structures of organic molecules, we use something called nuclear magnetic resonance. And basically what nuclear magnetic resonance does is it applies a, uh, a field, a high strength uh, magnetic field to uh, particles and those particles that contain nuclei with a uh, spin, an odd numbered spin. So the most common is um, proton NMR, so hydrogen 1 NMR. You use this electric field to align all the magnetic spins all in one direction, then you shoot a, uh, a radio frequency pulse at them, and then uh, depending on their electronic environment, some of that radio frequency energy is absorbed in order to flip the spin, and then the uh, energy released when it goes back to its um, to its polarized spin in the magnetic field is what is registered. Now that that um, energy coming out is actually related to the chemical environment. So you see here that the more uh, that the less electron density on the hydrogen atom in green here, the more shielded or downfield. Um, or I'm sorry, the more de-shielded or downfield or low electron density that's going to be. And then uh, the way that NMR spectra are typically plotted, we have um, high, uh, uh, high values to the left, low values to the right, and chloroform shows up at like 7.26 uh, ppm. And to know what ppm means, um, it's related to the uh, it's related to the energy and the frequency of the uh, of the magnet. Um, you can look in the text. Then we have acetone, which has kind of a moderate degree of electron withdrawal from the carbonyl oxygen atom, which is electronegative, and it sucks electron density uh, up into it and away from the hydrogen or protons, and so those show up a little bit above 2 ppm. Finally, we have a completely the opposite case where silicon is an electropositive element and kind of pushes electron density away from it. So these methyl groups on tetramethyl silane are going to be electron rich and thus uh, upfield or shielded or have a high electron density. And actually, it is tetramethyl silane that is used as the standard in NMR and that by convention gets the uh, ppm value of zero. Incidentally, NMR is also the basis for magnetic resonance imaging, which is used ubiquitously in biomedical engin uh, engineering. You've probably had an MRI um, or maybe have to see some soft tissue thing. And what it basically does is it measures the, uh, the perfusion of blood into various uh, structures, and then it uses the hydrogen signal to, um, to generate an image. 
Another popular method of spectroscopy is UV vis absorption. So in this case, you just have a sample, you shine light through it, and then you measure the uh, the spectrum on the way uh, on the way out. Depending on how you are trained, you either plot the absorbance versus wavelength in nanometers from uh, from low to high, or energy in electron volts from uh, from low to high. Now this actually has the annoying effect of giving you the uh, x-axis in kind of the inverted representation because you have high energy on the left in a plot of wavelength, but high energy is on the right in a plot um, versus uh, energy. In any case, you can often take the onset of absorption uh, at its intersection with the x-axis to be the optical band gap, in this case about uh, 660 nanometers. This is kind of just a hypothetical plot that I've drawn here, but you can see a few features. We usually say the left side is bluer, the right side is redder. There's a lambda max that is the maximum absorption. And then sometimes, especially in the solid state, you'll get these other types of absorption uh, profiles where you get other features that kind of emerge from the uh, from the structure. For example, if you have aggregation of a uh, of a chromophore that is the light absorbing part of a molecule or nanoparticle, you'll get these other effects. Another way that light interacts with matter is through the localized surface plasmon resonance. And that is an oscillation of the conduction electrons around a solid, uh, a, a, um, a metal a dielectric interface or metal air interface. And basically you can use these, you can use light waves of various polarizations to slosh these electrons back and forth. And that will tell you something about the size of the, uh, of the net size and possibly even the shape of the nanoparticles. Another form of spectroscopy is based on the ejection of particles upon interrogation. So this comprises a vast range of techniques, and we'll focus for a second on the photoelectric effect, which was uh, actually what Einstein won the Nobel Prize for um, in a series of a uh, few papers on relativity, the photoelectric effect, and uh, Brownian motion. Anyway, photoelectric effect is what he won the Nobel Prize for. In the photoelectric effect, what you do is you send a light wave in. So this is H nu, that's the photon energy. It strikes a metal surface and ejects what's called a photoelectron. And the kinetic energy of that photoelectron is going to equal the energy that came in minus the energy that it took to dislodge that electron from the surface, and that's called the work function, or this capital uh, phi. And this effect is actually used in a number of different techniques. For example, ultraviolet photoelec uh, photoelectric spectroscopy, just like it sounds, you basically shine an ultraviolet light. You can also use it in much, uh, much higher energy regimes. For example, in uh, X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy, you can actually get a lot of elemental information by shining really high energy light, so not visible light, but high energy X-rays at a structure, and the electrons deep within the uh, within the uh, in the inner shell electrons will actually be ejected. And those energies can be measured to, uh, to get a good idea of the composition of a structure. And furthermore, if you zoom way, way in on an individual resonance, say this is for carbon for, uh, for polyethylene terephthalate, depending on the bonding environment, the energies of the inner shell electrons are actually going to be different. So you can, uh, you can actually see what the bonding environment is from uh, from XPS. Okay, so how about imaging? So imaging is a technique of generating pictures, oftentimes using spectroscopic effects, but not uh, not always. So the most obvious form of imaging is just based on refractive object optics um, and magnification. That's called optical micros microscopy. And you might have played with an optical microscope as a kid, right? You get the slides and you look and you see the algae or the yeast cells or the onion skin and you could see all the cells and stuff and that's pretty cool, right? But in order to see molecular and nanoscale features, you often need other forms of imaging. And you can actually do quite a lot with uh, optical microscopy, particularly under polarization or uh, or under... 
uh, dark field imaging. So let me give you an example. So polarization microscopy is where you, you use a polarized light in order to, to shine through a, um, a sample. And if that sample has polarized elements in it, say anisotropically stretched structures or something, then that will uh, shine through more brightly than cross-polarized or than regions of the film that are cross-polarized. You can also use two polarizers that are oriented above and below the axis of the, uh, or above and below the position of the specimen so that you can see how much that specimen will actually rotate the light, which can be useful in, in detecting, for example, spherulites in a, uh, in a polymer sample, which appear as a, what's called a Maltese cross type structure in a cross section of a polymer, which is pretty, cool and uh, useful. Another type of imaging modality that's useful, uh, that's a useful add-on to optical uh, imaging is dark field imaging. So normally in uh, conventional microscopy, it's, it uses a bright field modality where you see all the light, you see the light reflecting back and you see to a lesser extent the light that is kind of scattered in other directions. And what, uh, what dark field imaging does is it blocks the light that's reflected directly back into the objective and it only allows in the light that's scattered around the edges and that allows you to see things like the scattering of edges and even the colored scattering due to localized surface plasmon resonance of nanoparticles and that's really cool because you can use an optical technique to measure something that is fundamentally nanoscale now you can't see the metal that makes up the wire, but you can see it glows like a lightsaber basically in the dark field image. And that's one of my favorite, absolute favorite kinds of nanoscale imaging because of its simplicity. Another technique which is super useful is electron microscopy. Electron microscopy comes in two different flavors, scanning and transmission electron microscopy. In scanning electron microscopy, what you do is you raster a beam across a surface, kind of like this, and then at each point in the surface, different amounts of electrons and even other particles are, uh, are scattered by the material under interrogation. And those scattered electrons can be picked up by detectors, which are located in different positions in the chamber and as a function of position you plot the intensity you put it on a screen and then you get the whole image and there are a few different kinds of, of particles there are secondary electrons which are the most uh, most commonly used the secondary electrons are electrons that are ejected from the material itself they're not necessarily the electrons that were used to probe those are called backscattered electrons which is a weaker signal and it's a different type of, uh, of produces a different type of image but secondary electrons um, give you a lot of information about the topography and the composition and the conductivity of different regions in the sample. Another type of uh, particle that's ejected are x-rays. So you, so this is sort of like um, XPS, but it's the opposite. Instead of photons in, electrons out, you have electrons in, photons out. And so an electron comes in, it excites um, an electron, the electron goes back, and then a uh, and then a photon is re released in the X-ray regime, and that's picked up by an energy dispersive X-ray detector, or EDX, or EDS, or EDAX, or whatever you want to call it. And so that information can be used to generate a compositional map, which can be superimposed on the topographic map that's produced by one of the secondary electron detectors to get a, a total image. Okay, now transmission electron microscopy uses a lot of the same detectors, except that in a transmission electron experiment, fundamentally what you care about is the, is the, uh, is the energy that's transmitted through the sample, or sorry, the electron pattern that's transmitted through the sample. And in this case, it's a lot like, it's, uh, it's a lot like optical microscopy. You shine a beam of electrons directly through, there's no rastering, you just shine it all through, and then there's a detector um, you know, at the bottom or the top or however the geometry is, and you can see very uh, small particles. You can even get the crystallographic structures of the, uh, of the material. So the, uh, the 
so electron beam crystallography can be used to measure the uh, atomic spacing in between your uh, your particles much in the same way that uh, Bragg reflection Bragg diffraction can be used uh, using x-rays to determine an x-ray crystal structure and there are some problems where you can figure out uh, how to solve some of those structures yourself finally you can get images using scanning probe techniques now scanning probe techniques rely on the fact that it is often easier to get a structure of the surface by touching the surface with a tool as opposed to shining a beam on it and there are two most most the two most popular ways of doing scanning probe techniques are atomic force microscopy um, for kind of everyday sort of imaging um, although it can be a bit of a pain to get a good image compared to SEM which is a little more plug and play and although it, an AFM is a simpler technique it actually uh, requires a lot more skill I always when I was in grad school got a friend to do it because I didn't have the dexterity to like manipulate the AFM tip and and pull it out of its little like house when you get one that's new in any way that's um, this is not a therapy session but anyway so this, uh, this tip gets scanned across the surface and you shine a laser on top and it strikes a detector to generate an image. It can be used in contact mode um, or more commonly tapping mode, which, uh, which uh, keeps the tip at, a, at kind of a fixed um, average distance while it taps out the surface and doesn't quite touch the surface, but it does measure things like uh, topography and in principle it measures things like polarizability or is affected by these electrostatic properties. STM is scanning tunneling microscopy and it is probably the most high resolution imaging technique that has ever been uh, developed and it uses a sharp conductive tip that applies a uh, that through which you apply a voltage to a surface and uh, at very close distances you'll get a tunneling current which is um, which is exponentially dependent on distance and it's actually possible to visualize molecule or visualize molecules and and atoms on a surface importantly uh, characterization tools most of them have a have an analog in nanofabrication so STM can be used not only to image atoms, but to move atoms around. So there's this famous image um, by Don Eigler and others on scooting atoms around on a surface to spell out the IBM logo. You can use AFM in a technique developed by Chad Merkin's group at Northwestern in a technique called, uh, called dip pen nano nanolithography, where you can dip an AFM tip in ink. Um, and then even uh, scanning electron microscopy can be reconfigured to do fabrication in the form of electron beam writing and even optical microscopy was originally developed or I'm sorry uh, was well, it was originally developed for characterization. The optics that were developed could were were um, uh, adaptively repurposed for the purposes of of uh, projection photolithography. So a lot of the same techniques that we use to image nanoparticles can also be used to create nanoparticles and systems.